Once upon a time in Japan, during the Sengoku period, creatures unknown to mankind appeared, known as Kishin, which brought Japan to the end of its existence. The only ones who opposed them were fighters called Bushi. But after a hundred years, people began to worship demons, and those who went against them were despised. Everyone had a dream to become a miner, but Musashi had a different dream, to become Bushi and stop the madness in the country. He, like everyone else, goes to school for future miners. The rest of the students notice Musashi's diligence in his work and consider him to be the best miner in the class. The guys make Musashi feel embarrassed, which makes him feel angry inside. During the lesson, the teacher despises the exterminators for social inequalities. Everyone thought it was true, but Musashi was on the side of the fighters. Musashi remembers. Just like when they trained with his friend Kajiru as a child, they promised each other to become bushy and eliminate the madness. The lesson ends. The teacher announced that there would be a ceremony the next day, where miners will go into a mine with demons. They are very happy about this. According to tradition, after the lesson, each miner will sing about his dream. Everyone says they want to become miners, but Musashi never brought himself to tell the truth about his dream of becoming a bushy. Therefore, like everyone else, he declared that he wanted to be a miner. Already outside, everyone says how cool it will be at the ceremony, but Musashi distances himself from everyone, insisting that he still has things to do. He went to his friend Kajiru, but he himself does not want to see him, and every time he drives Musashi away. But he came with the intention of putting an end to mining and said that it was time to go exterminate the demons. Kajiru, forgetting about the promise and remembering that he was despised because of Bushi's offspring, stands up to Musashi's wishes and declares that Musashi himself no longer takes this seriously. The guy doesn't give up, he declares that he will become a Bushi and runs away from Kajiru. But Kajiru's insistence was not in vain. He was a descendant of Bushi, and in school days, teachers told others that the Bushes were criminals. The day of the ceremony arrives. All the miners go into the mine, where, before its entrance, all the miners' things are taken away. Everyone wants to see what they want, so no one cares. And then the gate to the mine opened, and they were very scared. This promised paradise was filled with demons who watched over the miners' work. They have become slaves of this mine, and they will no longer be able to get out of there no matter what. Musashi knew that this would happen, and therefore he was glad to meet the demons, but he could not fight. His pickaxe was taken away, and he had nothing to fight with. But then on the floor he notices a pickaxe, with which he will desperately fight. At this time, the daydreaming Kajiru noticed the box Musashi had left on the floor. A training diary fell out of it, which told how Musashi had been training his pickaxe skills for years, in secret from everyone. During the fight with the demon, the other miners desperately tried to stop Musashi, but he was already blaming himself for lying to his dream. Having already been beaten and weakened at the hands of the demon, he finally cries out his dream of becoming a bushy. At this most needed moment, Kajiru saves Musashi by knocking down a demon on a motorcycle. He gives the weapon to Musashi, and they are already standing back to back, ready to fight together. The dream fight begins and in the end, the main demon Kishin comes. Musashi and Kajiru ride a motorcycle, knocking down demons. Along the way, Kajiru admits that the bushy are not heroes to him at all. Musashi showed no signs of seriousness and told Kajiru that he just needed to try. A demon stood in their way, which was Kishin. Musashi cuts him in two, but Kishin regenerates. Later, people who believe in Kishin come running. They bring him offerings so that Kishin will transform into his true form. Kishin transforms. In this form, Kishin easily knocks Musashi and Kajiru off his motorcycle. People loyal to Kishin say he hasn't been in this form for five years. In fact, Kishin only wants swords, so he grabs Kajiru and mercilessly tries to take his sword, but he grabs hold of him and refuses to let go. At the limit of his strength, Kajiru remembers his father's words that their swords are Bushi's pride, which is why he is so devoted to him. Eventually, Kajiru's powers run out and Kishin absorbs his sword. Influenced by the memories, an angry Musashi jumps onto Kishin's stomach. He immediately finds his weak point and begins to hit it. Kishin desperately tries to defend himself, but Musashi very cleverly dodges it. Musashi breaks the weak point. Kishin is overthrown. Musashi falls into the gastric juice to get Kajiru's sword. Musashi finds his sword and with a smile on his face, gives the sword to Kajiru. Kajiru is very grateful to him. Musashi says that he should take care of her. After defeating Kishin, Kajiru still decides to return to the path of Bushi, which makes Musashi very happy about this. People on the tower notice that the Bushi gang is approaching them. They are completely terrified. A huge temple levitating in the air breaks through the spatial barrier. It was broken by people who had the same motorcycles as Kajiru. It turns out that these people, the Take the Gang, came to finish off Kishin. Their leader asks the guys to move away for safety but they prove that they killed Kishin by ripping open his belly. The leader scoffs, he says that this is not enough, and at that moment Kishin gets to his feet again. The leader insists on escaping, but Musashi does not listen to him. 
While Kishin released the flames, Musashi stood irritably and told Kajiru that it was these bushi who were taking away their victory. Nothing stops Musashi and he attacks the rest of the demons diligently. The bushi gang, watching Musashi from afar, admired his diligence. Captain Neatora arrives and tells the others about Kishin's murder. The fight between Kishin and Musashi continues. Already standing in front of Kishin, Musashi is captured with a rope by Bushi Takeda's gang, who lands towards them. Captain Neatora wants to get Musashi into his ranks and therefore cannot let him go on fighting with Kishin. Musashi is dissatisfied with this, he did it for the sake of his dream, he expresses everything to Neatora, but he rudely refuses him, he does not want Musashi to die. Full of determination, Musashi gets out of the ropes, the captain ordered not to touch him, he sees in him a real bushy, who doesn't even feel sorry for his own life for this. While the rest of the bushy prepare to attack as a team, Musashi climbs the hill. The others are trying to stop him and there is a risk that he will come under Bushi's attack. But he had already used his father's technique. He makes the situation worse, and only prevents the rest of Bushi from defeating Kishin. He wants to defeat him himself. Kajiru standing below shouts at Musashi to aim at his main horn, this was the breaking point. Musashi thanked Kajiru and was already running towards Kishin's horn, he hits it with all his strength, but his pickaxe could not stand it and it broke. In despair, Musashi watched as Kishin aimed at him, but at that moment Neatora stood before his eyes. He praised Musashi and cut Kishin's horn. Did Neatora apologize for stealing the loot and warn Musashi that Kishin's body would disintegrate? Everyone rejoices at the victory over the demon. Each bushi absorbs the Kishin's powers with their swords. The bushi take the gang introduce themselves to the people from the ceremony, but they are not happy to meet them, they still blame bushi for everything. Neatora refutes their words with the honor of the entire gang, promising that they will fight in the name of their fallen comrades. Kajiru listens to the captain's words and admires him, but Musashi is still angry with him. He wanted to say something to the captain, but he restrained himself and was about to leave. The captain stops Musashi and continues to praise him. Musashi cannot restrain himself and begins to be rude to him, from which the captain, on the contrary, continues to praise him. He respected Musashi for his courage. He gives him a pendant with a huge crystal and leaves, mocking Musashi further. At home, Musashi and Kajiru talk about Neatora. Musashi is pissed off about him. Musashi did not see anything like that in the pendant that Neatora gave him and therefore was ready to break it. He is stopped by Kajiru and they both notice that it is a kaleidoscope. They both found out that this kaleidoscope indicate the location of the demons. They remember Neatora's words about searching for other Kishins and everything works out for them. Interested in the bushy swords, they decided to read the entire scroll. Kajiru couldn't read, so he did Musashi a favor. The scroll said that more than 100 more Kishins would attack the country, and they would all be different. They must be defeated. How the strongest bushy will come and defeat the strongest Kishin. This sign will be the unity of the country. Having received all the information from Musashi, he ran to Bushi Takeda to ask if it was all true. Musashi begins to question and notice every single thing, which makes all the Bushi surprised by his attentiveness. Musashi promises that he will defeat all the demons, and they support him. The next day, Musashi and Kajiru leave the city. Full of optimism, Musashi and Kajiru ride through unknown lands. They couldn't find anything and eventually they ran out of food. On the seventh day of adventure, the guys, exhausted by hunger, are rude to each other. But suddenly, Kajiru decides to go fishing, calling it the power of independence. Having caught plenty of fish, Kajiru mocks Musashi, saying that he could not do anything. Musashi leaves offended. Kajiru thought about his words and at that moment, Sugimi approaches him from behind. Musashi wants to forgive Kajiru and heads back to him, but sees Kajiru lying wounded. Frightened, Musashi runs up to Kajiru, but Tsugumi attacks him too, demanding all his valuables. Musashi resists, but Tsugumi does not let him go and engages him in battle. Tsugumi is unable to physically defeat Musashi, so she switches to another personality and tries to lure Musashi with her body. Musashi does not fall for this bait and throws Tsugumi back. Tsugumi becomes more serious and she activates her weapon, but a ringing sound comes from the cone-shaped hill to summon the entire Kasemda gang. Sugumi takes the motorcycle from the guys. Sugumi arrives at the temple and apologizes to her father Hideo, who is the leader of the gang. Kajiru and Musashi follow in Sugumi's footsteps with their cheeks full of food. Kajiru intends to take the bike back. The guys enter the temple and are met by Tsugumi, but with good intentions, which makes the guys suspicious. Walking past Tsugumi, the temple offers a view of the city beyond. Musashi didn't know that there were always civilizations behind the bushy temples, so Tsugumi talks about it in more detail, that the bushy are one big family that hunted demons wherever they were. Walking around the city, Musashi and Kajiru continue to be amazed by life here. Tsugumi is met by children who want to fight with her, from this sight, the guys remember their childhood. 
Kajiru replaces Tsugumi, and at this time Tsugumi communicates with Musashi. Musashi touches on the topic of ordinary life in the city, but Tsugumi only has bad memories of this topic. As a child, she lost her older sister whom she loved very much. Musashi finds out that they are similar to each other. Their conversation is interrupted by Kajiru asking Musashi to play with him and the children. Hideo invites Musashi and Kajiru to his temple to get to know each other. Hideo found out about their kaitsu transport and thought that they would look good in the ranks of his gang, and he invites them to join him. The guys are confused and Hideo gives a condition to share kaitsu with them. Not knowing what it was, the guys asked Hideo this question, but he considered them useless. Hideo ordered Tsugumi to tie them up and put them in prison, which she cannot refuse him. The boys are in captivity. Tsugumi apologizes for bringing the guys. Hideo is very cruel and negative towards those who are not capable of becoming his bushy. Due to the lack of worthy people, Hideo will be forced to order all residents to defend the city with their lives in the event of a demon attack. Tsugumi is against this since he understands that it will be cruel to send the elderly and children into battle, but Hideo is indifferent and begins to get angry at Tsugumi. A tearful Tsugumi came to the guys to tell them about Kaitsu and asked them for help in the great battle. Musashi is ready to help Tsugumi because he sees that she is excitedly keeping silent about something. Because of this, Tsugumi began to think about the past and ran away from the guys in tears. At dawn, with the skills of Kajiru, the guys escape from prison. Already at the top of the city they find their motorcycle, and at the same time a huge demon that was approaching the city. Tsugumi, running around the temple, is stopped by Hideo and reports that a demon is approaching the city. Hideo wants to carry out the plan and orders Tsugumi to bring out all the villagers to fight against the demon. Tsugumi refuses and forces Hideo to be upset with her, but Hideo is just playing with her emotions. He takes her and puts Tsugumi in front of the cliff, he says that he doesn't need her anymore. At the last moment, he gives her the chance to remain his bushy, which she does not refuse. Now Tsugumi is simply obliged to follow all his orders. Tsugumi is ready to run away from Hideo, but she is stopped by a storm of memories and Hideo's words. Completely depressed, Tsugumi cannot make up her mind, but then Musashi and Kajiru on a motorcycle fly into Tsugumi's wall and, as if nothing had happened, ask where their swords are. Tsugumi shouldn't tell them anything at Hideo's request, but they insist that she shouldn't listen to him. Tsugumi again blames herself for her weakness, Musashi supports and encourages her. Musashi offers to defeat the demon together and Tsugumi doesn't mind, she takes the guy's side. The demon is approaching. The guys watch the residents of the city, who will have to fight for Hideo, he orders them and the residents do not understand how they can fight the demon. Tsugumi attracts attention with a smoke bomb, trying to buy time for the villagers to escape. She begins to argue with Hideo about the best strategy against the demons and Hideo notices that she is up to something. While he suspected her further, Musashi and Kajiru knock out Hideo's henchmen in the smoke. Now the residents have a chance to escape, but they are still afraid of Hideo himself, who will be ready to execute everyone for their escape. Tsugumi decides to defeat Hideo so that the residents will no longer be afraid of him, but noticing this, he orders the guards to place the residents in positions. Musashi and Kajiru stop them from doing this. They tell Tsugumi to continue fighting Hideo while they themselves deal with the guards. Tsugumi, already with the weapon activated, runs to attack Hideo, but he was stronger than her. Tsugumi loses the fight and Hideo, despising all the residents as unable to live without him, beats Tsugumi further. He is stopped by Tsugumi's speech, who moves away from her. The second round begins, Tsugumi's weapon begins to strengthen. She overcomes her fears and attacks Hideo again. Trying to reason with the residents, Hideo starts shooting at Tsugumi with a bow. He misses every time and the time comes to finish off Hideo. Tsugumi grabs him with a rope and throws him to the ground with all his might. This time Tsugumi wins and she orders the villagers to flee. Everyone had already fled, but Tsugumi stayed with her father, holding him in ropes. The demon is already a couple of minutes away from her, she has no chance of escape. Tsugumi has already come to terms with death, but at the last moment, Musashi and Kajiru save her on a motorcycle. The temple and the city were destroyed, but no one cares because the leader whom everyone feared has been overthrown. The residents ask Musashi and Kajiru to take Tsugumi with them, but she is categorically against this, she does not want to forget what is valuable to her. She herself is confused in her choice and still joins Musashi and Kajiru, the squad gradually increases. The night before leaving, Musashi comes to the lonely Tsugumi to chat. Tsugumi still can't make up her mind and still thinks that without her father she is nothing. Musashi calms her down and tells her that Kajiru's father was like his father who gave him a dream. 
Emphasizing his dream, Tsugumi thinks about his own and decides to become stronger. The next day, the guys are seen off by the residents, but those who are so dear to her cannot let her go. Tsugumi makes a promise that when she becomes strong, she will return back to the others. Tsugumi, crying from loneliness, annoys the guys. Tsugumi's going crazy in order to make friends with Musashi, she does strange things. Musashi does not understand her well and cannot understand how to harmlessly refuse her actions. Kajiru, looking at this, does not want Tsugumi to win Musashi's heart, friendship with Musashi is more valuable to him. In the end, she tells the whole truth to the guys, but they thought that they were already friends. Sugumi never made friends with anyone outside the gang, and she acted on the advice of her older sister. Sugumi, thinking that Kajiru was angry at her because of the insult, avoided him. Musashi and Kajiru accepted her and understood her, now they are definitely friends. After spending the night, the no longer sleeping Musashi notices how Kajiru's sword is being chewed by the Oni. They noticed this and ran away with Kajiru's sword, Musashi catches up with him and hits him on the head with a stick, causing it to crack. In an attempt to break the horn, they ran to an unknown place, where swords were stuck into the ground everywhere. Musashi meets a guy in a hood and advises him to take one of the swords from the ground in order to defeat the Oni who was eating Musashi's sword. He, noticing this, instantly takes out the first sword he comes across, an aura comes from the sword and he literally gains control of Musashi. The wanderer orders Musashi to cut the demon, and without thinking, he cuts the Oni's horn. Musashi is surprised by the strength of the katana and shiru, considering him not a novice user of the kaitsu sword. Musashi stood and took the strength of the defeated demon, but the sword could not stand it and broke. Musashi apologizes to shiru, but he says that he didn't need her. But Shiru, interested in this, looks into the soul of Musashi, he is mistaken in his thoughts. Standing on Mount Nanao, she says it's time to leave. Going down to Shiru, she again notices his field of swords, it turns out that Shiru is a sword fanatic who imagines girls in them. Musashi, who calls out to these two, asks who they are, they coldly answer him that they are chain dogs and they have no names. After listening to Musashi, Sugumi talks about a place that sells kaitsu swords. They instantly arrived at that place and are ready to buy swords. Completely delighted, Musashi cannot stop wondering about the city, he wants to get the sword as soon as possible. In a restaurant, a man accosts the guys and mocks them for not having a name for their gang. Sugumi asks Musashi and Kajiru why they became bushy, to which they answer that it was their dream. Now we need to decide who will be the captain, Musashi, without hesitation, chooses Kajiru. Kajiru is surprised, but the name of the gang is determined by a surname, which Kajiru does not have. Musashi comes up with the surname Kajiru and they are now the Kanemaki gang. An auction for kaitsu blades has begun in the city. There are so many of them that Musashi doesn't know which one to choose. Mitsuru, as the leader of the blacksmiths, advises taking the one that like best in appearance. Musashi comes up with an excellent sword and Mitsuru praises the newcomer for his excellent choice. Kajiru took a long time to decide and decided to settle on the one that is similar to him. Mitsuru declares the auction open and tells the guys to pick up their swords. Musashi takes the sword by the hilt and feels the same feeling as then. In the field of swords, Mitsuru calls this the ritual of choosing the owner of the sword. Kajiru also takes the sword and the ritual begins, visual effects fill Kajiru, but this is just a custom. The ceremony was successful and now Kajiru has a new sword. Kajiru looks at the people who also went through the ritual and notices that the colors of the sword aura are different for everyone. Asking Mitsuru a question, she says that Bushi has his own soul color and unfortunately, the blue color Kajiru received turned out to be the most common one. In addition to blue, there are four more colors, but each of the gang wants a person with a red soul. Musashi is still on the test, but as he passed, he began to feel differently. Suddenly the memories changed their tone and Musashi had to see the day of Kajiru's father's execution. The shell of Musashi falls into pitch darkness, from where the appearance of a girl appears, it turns out to be the appearance of the sword itself and the sword removes Musashi. In real time, Kajiru and Tsugumi notice how Musashi is covered in spikes and a black aura, unfortunately this means that Musashi is rejected by the sword. After several more attempts to pass the test, Musashi was unable to pass it. Preparing for the next time, Mitsuru stops him, saying that he won't succeed, his body is not designed to use kaitsu swords. Guys come to the depressed Musashi to support him, but at that moment Kishin falls from the sky. The residents riot and Kishin attacks the frightened Musashi, Kajiru repels his attack. Small demons are attacking the city and the only one who protects it is Kajiru. He copes well with the powers of the new sword, people thank him for saving him. Musashi, who watched the battle, feels useless because he never fulfilled his dream like Kajiru did. All swordsmen are called to the mountain. Kajiru and Tsugumi leave Musashi at his request. 
Musashi cannot understand why everything went smoothly on the field in the morning but today it didn't work out for him, remembering that moment. Shiru appears behind Musashi, he was watching all the time and so he decides to show Musashi that he, too, is rejected by a sword. Shiru is extremely happy that he met someone like him. Shiru invites Musashi to become stronger because after all, he knows another way. Shiru explains how to accept a rejected sword, he need to surrender to the will of the sword in order to become the kaitsu blade yourself. Shiru proves his strength and in one fell swoop makes a huge hole in the ground, which he soon chops into small pieces in the same fell swoop. Musashi cannot believe Shiru's words and he does not want to become a sword, he wants to stay with Kajiru and Tsugumi. Shiru listens to Musashi and he wants to go to the guys so that they can become part of the weapon. Shiru throws Musashi into the pit so that he can collect ore for the sword. Climbing to the foot of the mountain, Tsugumi begins to talk about rejecting Musashi's swords, thinking that he comes from a special family and that his strength cannot be expressed in words. Kajiru remembers where Musashi was born and in the midst of tension says that he was just a farmer, Tsugumi gets angry at him. Kajiru tells about the eccentricities of character and mutual understanding of Musashi in childhood when they first met. Nanao comes to Shiru in order to chat with Musashi, she liked him, but soon finds out that he was thrown into a pit and gets upset. And Shiru calls him a hypocritical villain who is only taken seriously in Kaitsu knowing that he has found his goddess in Musashi. Nanao asks why Shiru hasn't taken the goddess out of Musashi yet, Shiru intends to use the guy as material for a sword. Falling into a lava pit, Musashi at the last moment catches a katana flying next to him and clings to the wall, turning into a dark crystal. Using the crystals released from his body, Musashi manages to rise a little, but he is distracted by a girl's voice inside him, losing consciousness, finally turns into a crystal. Musashi's consciousness is transferred to a strange place where the obsidian goddess was already located. Musashi asks her to go back, but she doubts him and does not let the guy go. The angry goddess forces Musashi to remember his indecency on the part of the inhabitants of his city after the death of his parents. Musashi was hated by all the inhabitants and despised him every time. One family allowed him to stay, but he was not supposed to go out and attract attention in any way, he was hated more and more for his disobedience. And the only thing the others entrusted to Musashi was to throw a stone at Kajiru's father so that they would think that he was normal. Completely horrified, Musashi remains to do so and belittle Kajiru's father. The goddess presses on Musashi's sore spot, despising him in every possible way, saying that he will never become bushy. If Musashi had mastered the sword, he would have been a red soul, and the goddess was afraid that she would be hunted. Musashi, losing his will, remains with the goddess. At the top of the mountain, the other swordsmen see the headless, but still alive Kishin in her tents. While exploring the explanation, Shiru appears on Kishin's body and says that it was he who took the head. Ignoring all the questions and warnings of the swordsmen, Shiru advances towards Kajiru and destroys the swordsmen with the goal of taking all the powers of the kaitsu swords. The surviving swordsmen are terrified, and only now Shiru realizes that in front of him is the Kajiru he needs. He talks about Musashi's transformation and that he will need Kajiru in order to turn him into a sword. Having been turned into crystal, Musashi is still in the subconscious of the goddess, who does not want to let him go. But their process is interrupted by Nanao, who mistakenly catches Musashi. Musashi's body returns to normal and he remembers the words of Shiru, who intends to turn Kajiru and Tsugumi into crystals. Musashi runs to his friends to save them. Along the way, Musashi remembers all the kindness and acceptance from Kajiru's father, which cheers him up. On the mountain, Shiru carries out a massacre, and in order to protect the others, Kajiru responds to him and takes all the attention on himself. Kajiru tries to somehow harm Shiru, but he can't cope and Shiru hurts the guy in one fell swoop. Grabbing Kajiru, he begins to despise him, but at this moment Musashi is already standing behind him. Kajiru and Tsugumi are glad to see their friend alive, looking at his outfit, they wonder about accepting the sword, to which he simply remains silent. Shiru, who noticed the living Musashi, is very surprised and begins to blame Nanao who came to him. Shiru doesn't fully trust Musashi's powers, so he wants to see his powers and comes up with a plan to extract the goddess from the guy's body. Kajiru is still wary of Shiru, thinking that they are trying to kill him. Musashi, who stands in the way, encourages the guys and lets them remember the words of their relatives. Kajiru, Tsugumi and Musashi prepare to fight against Shiru and Nanao. Nanao divides her staff into seven blades, preventing the guys from attacking her. Musashi admires her even in such a situation. Shiru chose to simply watch her employees battle and encourages her. Musashi calculates all of Nanao's attacks and decides to attack her. Piercing a stone with his sword, he puts all his might on the impulse of the blow and deftly flies over Nanao's blades, but she easily repels him. The wary guys still can't come up with a plan to fight over Nanao, but it seems that Kajiru has come up with something. 
Shiru is impatient to see the verdict of the Obsidian Goddess, and Nano still intends to kill Musashi. The guys decide to act according to plan, Nano thinks that they will attack with the whole crowd and therefore sees an advantage in the number of swords. But Musashi and Tsugumi simply run away in different directions, trying to confuse Nano, who thinks it over and decides to finish him off Musashi first. So she connects all the blades together and points them at Musashi, he defends himself and Tsugumi wraps the ropes around the blades with his weapon, the plan works. While Nano's powers are contained, Musashi attacks her and cuts her staff. The guys rejoice, considering this a victory, but Nano says that it was only one of seven blades. Shiru intervenes in the battle, having seen Nano's broken blade. Now Nano will fight Shiru, she thought, but he ordered her to retreat, calling her weak. Shiru prepares to attack and gets into a pose, emitting black mana, which makes the guys worry. In one fell swoop, he creates space around the mountain, lifting it up and turning it upside down. Musashi and the guys manage to hang on while everyone else falls to their death. Having noticed those who are caught, Shiru draws a territory under them and sends them flying down. He begins to despise those who are weaker than him and says similar words to what the goddess said. After a few words, Shiru completely turns off gravity and sends everyone to fall. Suddenly the world stops, the goddess who stopped everything here looks out from the mountain. She says that the Shiru gang are her sworn enemies who are trying to get her powers. Therefore, if Musashi dies, it will become a problem for the goddess. She tries to take Musashi's soul so that she can stay with her in peace, but Musashi refuses, saying that for him the meaning of life lies not in this, but in the power of friendship. Listening to Musashi, the goddess trusts all her strength and flows into Musashi's body. For everyone, time comes back and they notice it. Suddenly, the swords of all swordsmen begin to be attracted to an unknown clot of power, even Shiru's sword begins to behave strangely, as a result, his sword goes to the obsidian goddess who was born. Her power is so great that it stops the chaos of Shiru, the mountain rises to its place, and those who fell survived. The goddess stands opposite Shiru, who was very happy to see the goddess appear. The goddess, telling Kajiru that he should definitely watch the fight. Nanao tries to strike the goddess, but she distorts her sword energy, preventing her from hitting her. Using powers similar to a magnet, the goddess explains how accepting a sword works. Kajiru cannot believe that Musashi can repel any attack, but at the same time, the existence of the goddess in the real world is exhausting her, she should hurry up, because Musashi may lose the power of obsidian. From now on, Kajiru will fight alongside Musashi, the goddess giving him the power of self-hypnosis with a kiss. The terribly happy Shiru invites the goddess to join his gang, which was expected to be refused in response. By gathering all the borrowed powers of Bushi together, the goddess creates matter, which she directs towards Shiru. After a powerful attack, only destroyed mountains remain and Musashi returns to his body. Sugumi and Kajiru run to praise Musashi, they still can't believe Musashi's powers. After a brief argument between Sugumi and Kajiru, Sugumi notices Musashi's rusty katana and points at it, the sword crumbling. Mitsuri says that this means that Musashi's potential has not yet been revealed and thanks him for saving him with the others. Suddenly, residents notice a huge hole with Kishin's missing body. A space is cut above the sea, from which the living Nanao and Shiru emerge with the body of Kishin. At that moment Shiru managed to use his technique and escape. A funeral is taking place in the city. Everyone will honor the memory of their loved one. Sugumi also becomes sad because of the memories of her sister, and just as quickly becomes cheerful. At night, Mitsuri provides the guys with a place to sleep, Sugumi is incredibly happy with the soft beds. The leaving Mitsuri stops Musashi with a request to take the test again. In the morning, Musashi comes to the test, where there were already spectators and were ready to watch what was passing with anticipation. Sugumi is afraid for Musashi, because he chose the very sword that refuted him. Mitsuri declares the test started. Before taking the katana, Musashi remembers Tsugumi's words and raises them in front of all Bushi. Full of strength, Musashi takes the sword and amazingly passes the test, becoming a red soul. The Bushi crowd does not allow passage in front of Musashi and rejoices for him. Kajiru is jealous of Musashi. Tsugumi reminds him about the colors of souls and that Musashi's is the rarest. Kajiru understands everything. A tense Musashi approaches the still jealous Kajiru and calls him to talk. Musashi tells him about the visions during the test and the goddess who showed him his father. Musashi seems that the father and the goddess are somehow connected. Asking Kajiru about this, he first denies what he heard, but at the same time suspects his father of secret connections with Bushi because he left him a motorcycle and Bushi swords. It turns out that all this is true, Shiru tells Nano about the cruel deeds of Kajiru's father and that he had the powers of the obsidian goddess who after a while switched to Musashi. The guys are getting ready to leave the city of blacksmiths. Kajiru, who was repairing a motorcycle, still couldn't believe about his father's activities, but following in his footsteps, he should understand something. Tsugumi and Musashi wait a long time for Kajiru, 
thinking that he is still jealous of Musashi. Kajiru reminds you of himself and comes with food, equipment and a map. Looking at the map, Sugumi and Musashi can't stop wondering where to go next. Kajiru quickly determines their location and, full of motivation, suggests going east. The guys got lost in the forest and, moreover, cannot get out of it because of the swamp road. Kajiru and Sugumi argue about who will drive the motorcycle, and in the end Musashi decides to take the wheel. The guys are trying to prank him and play along, Musashi calmed them down a little. Musashi asks not to let go of the motorcycle, but at this moment, instead of Kajiru and Tsugumi, the Marsh Kishin is holding the motorcycle. Being inside the demon's trap, Kajiru and Tsugumi ask to save them. Musashi, in addition to them, notices someone else and prepares for battle. Musashi finds Kishin's horn and attacks him head on. The forces of the defeated demon are absorbed by the sword. Kajiru and Tsugumi thank Musashi, and they also notice someone in the cocoon. Musashi breaks the cocoon in which a cute girl lies. She thanks the savior and seems to be starting to like the guys. Tsugumi is confused. Suddenly, from afar, someone calls the girl, calling her princess. Mikairu decides to introduce herself and it turns out that she is the daughter of the head of Bushi Saruwatari. She was going to battle for the fate of the nation. The princess's assistant provides transport and now they are traveling together. Musashi notices Mikairu's change in mood and tries to calm the situation, but she remains silent. When she tried to talk to Musashi, she was only happy when he remembered her name. Suddenly the carriage crashes and Musashi and Mikairu fall from the mountain. Mikairu creates an umbrella from his blade and hay parried. Mikairu admits that she is a recluse and did not know how to maintain a dialogue. Musashi talks about his adventure and Mikairu advises not to go to the east and points towards the east from which a huge monster is moving, devouring everything in its path. Musashi gets scared looking at this. Mikairu talks about this Kishin in more detail, it was the very first and most powerful Kishin, whom no one could defeat, and his name is Dark Kishin. The guys must take some measures against Kishin, but their strength is not enough to defeat him. The assistant says that the leader of the Tatsuomi gang will be able to defeat this Kishin, according to him. He is among the strongest commanders. Nations at a certain place must unite and defeat the Dark Kishin, and the assistant hopes for Musashi to join the ranks of Yusuke Bushi, leaving him and the guys. The princess leaves, the guys are left alone and try to find out about Kishin on the Bushi scroll. Tsugumi notices the scroll and says that every Bushi gang had such scrolls. They are getting closer to the truth and now know that Kajiru's father was among the most powerful Bushi, Yusugi Bushi. People who are part of the Yusugi gang alliance gather at the port. Each squad sees each other as if for the first time. Tatsuomi, sitting alone on the roof, moves towards the east. Nanao, leaving the store with gifts for Shiru, suddenly feels something in the place of her heart. She comes to a deserted place where she already checks the sore spot. Black crystals are released from Nano's chest, from which a collection of all obsidian powers is included. Everyone announces their plans. Musashi, Tsugumi and Kajiru head to the port where they will see the ocean for the first time. Approaching the ocean, Kajiru is ready to learn everything about his father. The guys are enjoying the ocean and having fun, but Kajiru can't find Yusugi. Tsugumi notices the Yusugi gang banners on the ships, and then a flying temple belonging to him. Kanatatsu does not allow the guys on board, because they are strangers. When asking which clan the guys belonged to, they told about their own and only made it worse, everyone found out about the uninvited guests and now they must capture them. Musashi tries to resist, but is easily knocked to the ground by a Kahiro. Doubting Musashi's powers, a helicopter descends from the sky. People who notice the coat of arms immediately kneel down and take to comes out of the helicopter. Confused, Musashi still has a negative attitude towards him. Musashi, whose name he has already forgotten, tries to talk to Takeda. But out of habit of laughing at the guy, Takeda teases the guy. Tsugumi, who noticed the improper communication with Bushi, elegantly makes a remark to the guys, from which the guys are in a stupor because they noticed how polite Tsugumi had become to them. The rest talk about Takeda's achievement and now the guys know how big the fish turned out to be. Kanatatsu is ready to take the Kanemaki gang to court for trespassing without an invitation, but Takeda defends them by saying that they serve him. Takeda goes on board leaving Musashi, the path to Tatsuomi is blocked for him. Takeda comes into Tatsuomi's temple and talks about the guys with the goal of leaving them alive. Tatsuomi believes his nonsense about submission and leaves them alive. On one of the islands, an obsidian warrior comes to Kishin Orochi. The warrior intends to destroy the alliance of the Yusugi gang. Along with the Kanemaki gang, Ayashi and Shunrai are sailing on a boat, they are also going to Kanatatsu. Ayashi was taken off guard for this event, so he is not very happy to meet Musashi, but he is even polite to him. Shunrai can't let them near Yusugi because it could be dangerous. When questioned by Musashi, she replies that their gang values their family blood above all else, which is feuding with the rest of the bushi. Kajiru is disappointed, but Musashi cheers him up. Confident guys want to fight along with everyone, 
but Ayashi stops them, repeating that their forces will not bring any benefit, he shows on the scroll the designated Kishin, whom they then defeated and, for comparison, shows in the very center of the same Kishin, because of which there will be a war. That's why he's from Four Lick. Likai are the children of the darkest Kishin. Misashi does not understand how to defeat the main one, Shunrai first advises finishing off his children. Their goal is to kill Orichi Kishin. The guys, secretly from everyone, decide to launch Musashi to explore the Tatsuomi place. Admiring the views of the island, Musashi faces a misfortune, Tatsuomi himself sits down in front of him, but he only talks about unwanted victims during the war with Dark Kishin. Kanatatsu comes running to Tatsuomi and asks him to come to the warriors. Hearing Kanatatsu call the man master, everything falls into place for Musashi. Kanatatsu catches Musashi and, bombarding him with questions, reveals the truth to Tatsuomi, who sends him to the barracks. The Tide King Maki gang is led to be distributed. Separated from friends, Musashi enters the room with the rest of the swordsmen, he immediately determines who is who. Among the crowd, the question is asked who will be the main commander. Each commander comes out and identifies himself and then, some challenge others, commotion begins. Suddenly Mikairu comes into the room, she was worried about the guy and came for him. The guards ask the troops to calm down. Musashi seizes the chance to find out more about Kajiru's father. Musashi is ready to take the fight for the responsibility of commanding the troops. Katsumi declares sword fighting from the blunt side. The fight begins and Akihiro joins Katsumi, but Musashi does not intend to lose. Musashi sees his opponents as punching bags and puts all his father's skills to the test on Katsumi. Akihiro attacks from behind, activating his blades in his legs and slams Musashi into the wall. Akihiro is a very skilled opponent, Musashi is unable to defeat him and is taken to the ground again. The completely crippled Musashi accepts defeat, but in order to protect Katsumi, he offers to put up. Katsumi doesn't mind and he shakes his hand, but Akihiro realized that he was lying. Akihiro brings out the fear of the guys and shames them in front of everyone, now he platoons all the squads. Musashi doesn't understand what he did wrong. Akihiro states his rules as a commander, everyone must obey him and follow his orders. Musashi is the only one who dared to stand against his rules, and he pisses off the commander. The others are satisfied with the conditions and explain to Musashi that this is normal. Musashi asks Mikairu how they are different from slaves, she talks about her reasons in the future, and asks not to call them that. No one takes Musashi's side, and he begins to get angry, but remembers his friends, thinking that at least they will stand up for him. But having arrived in the room where his friends were having fun along with the new squad, he stands in shock. It seems Tsugumi and Kajiru begin to forget about each other. Sailing on the ship, in front of the squad, Akihiro speaks words that Musashi does not like, and he again opposes him. He is supported by others because he is angry for them. Irritated, Musashi sits down again to peel potatoes, while saying something about the commander's disobedience. Kijin Asuka approaches Musashi to make friends with him, because since yesterday no one has paid attention to him. The guys become friends, but because of the way Kijin Asuka and Musashi speak, he begins to enrage him. Kanatatsu, who actually leads the entire vanguard, comes to them. The task of the vanguard is to lure all the small oni into one place. But even in such a situation, Kanatatsu sits and counts taxes. Musashi doesn't understand what this commander's strength is, but he prefers to use a brush instead of a sword and calls Musashi a weakling. An angry Musashi comes out of commander's cabin, where those same small oni are already meeting him from the sea, trying to immediately cut the horn, he fails. One of the demons clings to the ship with his teeth, trying to turn it over in order to stop the demon. Musashi climbs on him and begins to hit his horn, but ordinary blows do not help him. Another demon approaches behind Musashi to devour him. The vanguard employees are asked how such a weak commander can protect his platoon, but Kanatatsu makes himself known and saves Musashi and, like a spark, immediately cuts the horns of two demons. Tatsuomi gave part of his name to Kanatatsu, seeing him as his strongest ally. Kanatatsu used one of his red soul forms and absorbs the Oni's powers. Kanatatsu asks Masayuki to record every battle of the vanguard, but he teases the commander and a small argument begins. Kanatatsu has a funny way of arguing with his subordinates. Kanatatsu asks them to stay in formation, but they didn't understand why, since the battle was over, the rest of the Oni were coming out of the sea, there were so many of them that it was hard to count them. Kanatatsu encourages the entire frightened squad and, with his own strength and chains, gathers several Oni into one column. Gathered in one row of demons, Kanatatsu instantly breaks their horns in flight. While in the castle, Takeda and Tatsuomi have memories. Tatsuomi and his people have found the obsidian goddess, and he wants to change the course of history, but the black dogs are also aimed at the goddess. Takeda is sent for reinforcements. Kajiru and Tsugumi cheerfully celebrate their victory with their squad. While the rest of the squads don't know what to do with themselves, they are very angry with Akihiro. Kijin Asuk and the girls search for Musashi, but cannot find him. 
Then, after defeating the Kishins, Musashi decided to find out more from them and as a result, everyone rejected him, and now he sits in front of the sea all sad. That night, Musashi wants to escape but is stopped by Katsumi. Having retreated to a deserted place, Katsumi understands Musashi's feelings and begins to motivate him, the guys begin to get along. Katsumi regrets not becoming a commander, he spoke about his reasons for becoming one, which made Musashi wonder why and why he was fighting against Oni. Each platoon comes to check in and bring back loot. The marines see the lack of men in the platoon, to which the entire platoon responds that Musashi himself ran away. At this moment, Musashi himself breaks into the room, his friends are happy to see him. Training time begins for Musashi, where his teacher is Katsumi. Nikairu, who is watching them, becomes covered in black crystals. Yamato no Orochi eats and eats or, Yataru assumes that he will eat everything in five days, and until then, he is going to finish off Musashi and take the goddess. Nikairu gets in touch with Yataru's father, where she reports to him all the reports about the Yusugi gang, but her true goal is to take the goddess and finish off Musashi. In fact, Mikairu is the most successful daughter Yataru ever had and she is the only one who has a name. Mikairu, who is observing the training, is approached by her undercover people, and several more traders are announced among the bushi. Katsumi teaches Musashi how to control the sword's energy, but he fails several times. Katsumi dispels Musashi's fear by telling him more about battle tactics. While the guys fight in the second round, Mikairu stands and remembers the first meeting with Musashi, in the end, she does not want to kill him. According to the disclosure, Katsumi invites Musashi to join forces with Mikairu, he does not mind and invites Mikairu to join, she is very embarrassed and agrees. Mikairu points his blade towards Musashi and connects with Musashi, but upon connecting, they both begin to turn into black crystals. They turned into something similar to a ship on which Mikairu is going to take Musashi out, everyone nearby is horrified. Upon reuniting the two stones, Musashi is once again taken into Mikairu's subconscious, where they will resonate. The form of two crystals begins to open fire on everyone, Kuroko creates an energy cage around it, from which they cannot escape. Mikairu is running out of strength to maintain this form, his subordinates, along with Tatsuomi, block the path in case of their escape. Kuroko suspects Mikairu of being a spy and invites Tatsuomi to question her. Tatsuomi finds out that the spy is Musashi and talks about his crucifixion. On the day of the execution, Kajiru and Tsugumi try to talk their way out of the execution. Mikairu wants to save Musashi with her stone. Kiroko, having received a signal about the location, tells the leader about this. Tatsuomi is about to hit Avaji with all his might. Tatsuomi reminds about the purpose of the alliance and says that whoever cuts at least one horn will be awarded a personal temple. All Bushi and Akihiro's platoon are inspired. They want to get the trophy, but due to the consequences between Musashi and Mikairu, Kanatatsu forbids them to go out to fight. At the sight of the crucifixion, Mikairu comes to Musashi's aid. Yataru reveals the whereabouts of the goddess to Seroku, while Mikairu frees Musashi. Akihiro approaches Musashi, pointing a blade at him, he will torture Musashi with questions for the sake of a reward from Tatsuomi. Musashi can't understand where his mood went. Suddenly, three strange people with the bodies of Kishin jump on this trio, calling Mikairu little sister. Musashi and Akihiro come up with a plan to escape, and the wanderers, through conversations, reveal Mikairu's identity to the guys. Musashi can't believe it, but in the face of Akihiro he is now a real spy. A tearful Mikairu apologizes and says that it's all true. Before the boys, Mikairu contacts her father, who reminds her of her goal. Mikairu, running only for his father's trust, cannot kill Musashi, and under pressure from relatives, they make her cry more. They take her and force her to point the sword at Musashi. Musashi takes the sword from her and allows Mikairu to escape. While trying to escape, one of the relatives catches up with them, but in order to protect Musashi, Mikairu sacrifices himself and before his eyes, Mikairu is eaten by Oni. The captains arrive in time and save Mikairu. The Oni regenerate the wounds and reveal the goddess that was inside someone whose name was not mentioned. Due to Kiroko's interest, she runs towards Musashi and he tries to stop her, but she dodges and only helps Mikairu not to die from bleeding. Musashi thanks her and asks Kiroko why she is helping them. She, who answered this, almost told the truth and, out of awkwardness, offers to be friends with Musashi. Bushi defeats several Kishin and only three remain. Due to lack of strength, Oanami and Minami ask Misima to feast on her. The Oni begin to eat their older sister, gaining strength from her. Yataru's father considers this normal, and further incites the younger ones. Iwanami and Minami transform into the bodies of Yamato no Orochi, Kanatatsu immediately attacks Minami, but she repels his attack. After their transformation, the city was attacked by the same Oni, devouring the inhabitants. Kanatatsu cannot tolerate lawlessness and distributes the platoons to their places. Kiroko and Musashi watch as Bushi fights, whose attacks are repelled. Yataru orders to finish off Mikairu and they eat other Oni, 
becoming bigger and stronger. Yataru explains his point of view to Musashi, which he finds disgusting. Already at the height, having united with the forces of Bushi Tatsuomi, he is preparing an attack. Yellow rays are reflected by Minami, which are directed towards Tatsuomi's allies. Musashi and Oni do not understand why he hits his own, but Kiroko explains that Tatsuomi's yellow soul only increases the physical strength of his allies. Bushi blades become sharper, speed and strength increase. Snarling with Yataru, Tatsuomi gives strength and support to his allies, he gives the order to destroy all Oni. The Oni can no longer cope with the forces of Bushi and they lose to them by making fatal mistakes. Residents admire Bushi as they did at the time, but could not understand how the Oni got into the castle under the influence of enormous protection. On the ceiling of Tatsuomi's house, a space appears from which Shiru emerges. With his sword powers, he is the one who moved the demons here and kills Tatsuomi. Joyful residents rejoice, but the commanders still do not understand how the demons appeared. While talking to Kanatatsu, Shiru counters at them, saying that he was the one who brought the demons. The captains are very angry and Shiru picks up the sword of the fallen Tatsuomi, blood oozes from the castle. Enraged by the news, Kanatatsu attacks Shiru, but fails. He joins forces with Bushi. Kiroko captures Shiru, ready to attack Kanatatsu, noticing that his strength has fallen, Shiru has broken the chains of energy. Kiroko can't believe what she's seeing. Suddenly Seroku appears out of thin air and comes to help his brother. The angry captains try to join forces with Bushi, but Seroku seals this opportunity and now wonders how they will fight without this technique. Seroku asks Shiru to kill all Bushi, but he refuses and begins to chat and rejoice at meeting Musashi. Musashi cannot let Shiru rampage again, but Shiru cuts the space and swaps Musashi with Yamato no Orochi, the dragon that appears erases everything in its path. Musashi appeared in the middle of the island, where there was a dragon before him, Yataru approaches him with a request to give up his daughter, he refuses and Musashi forces the enemy to take out his sword. Upon the return of the obsidian goddess, Yataru intends to take the compass that will determine the fate of the east. Musashi thinks about how he will cope with such a katana as Mikairu already comes to his senses and kneels before his father, begging him not to kill Musashi. The father considers this a betrayal, but Mikairu says that Musashi, who was able to accept her, is more valuable to her. After Mikairu's story, Musashi hates her father more and more. Yataru suddenly becomes kinder to her and tries to console her. Musashi begins to smell something wrong and, as it turns out, he really wanted to kill her. After Musashi protects Mikairu, Yataru says goodbye to his daughter and turns her to stone. Chaos continues in the city. Kanatatsu is captured by a thread which seriously harms him. The parrying Shiru becomes bored with the fight and becomes more interested in the goddess. Due to the failure of the task and Mikairu's tears, Yataru turned his daughter to stone for such reasons. Yataru tells in more detail how Mikairu was born and that this stone shell is Mikairu herself. His stories hit Musashi where it hurts, he tries to convince Yataru and soon, he manages to beg Mikairu to return. Mikairu's stone shell breaks and she returns. Musashi is very happy to see her, but during Yataru's transformation he destroyed her memory and emotions. Mikairu no longer has a clue who is standing in front of her. Musashi gets extremely angry at Yataru and starts fighting him. After several serious attacks, Mikairu approaches Yataru from behind, piercing him with crystals. The father beats his daughter and it seems to him that the memory is not completely erased. Little by little, Shiru's ability weakens and Musashi bids farewell to Mikairu. In the city, Takeda's gang comes to help, Takeda cannot find Tatsuomi, Shiru calls him and says that he has his head. Shiru and Takeda make eye contact for the first time. The fight between them begins. In front of the wounded Kanatatsu, Seroku prepares to finish him off, but time is running out and he must retreat. The guys vow to kill each other the next time they meet. Kanatatsu and the others descend into an unknown basement. He notices a sword in Tsukumi's hands, which she gives to Musashi. The guys take an oath to fight and not run away. Going down to the basement, the guys will learn about the secrets of the goddess. Kanatatsu tells the story of the birth of the goddess in more detail, and that those who have the goddess in their souls are dominated by her full power, but Musashi recalls that after the battle with Shiru, the goddess's strength ran out. Therefore, by coming here, Kanatatsu will help return the powers of the goddess for Musashi. Kanatatsu brings a box containing an artifact that will release divine power, but the guys don't understand why he helps them. Kanatatsu's goal is to return Musashi's powers so that he can help defeat Yamato no Orochi. Helping the rest of the allies not to die, the guys understand him and support him. Kanatatsu talks more about the black dogs, Musashi begins to hate them more. Kanatatsu opens a box with an artifact that contained the blood of the obsidian goddess, drinking which Musashi will regain his powers. Kanatatsu says to drink the blood, but Musashi sees some kind of nonsense in this. Musashi forces him to forcefully drink the blood. After he drinks, he supposedly shows actions on him, but in reality he does not feel anything. 
As he leaves the basement, Musashi appears to see something behind him. Strategist Kiroko came up with new plans for attack while having three targets. The vanguard, numbering 10,000 people, was tasked with defeating 10,000 Oni. The Take the Gang is tasked with defeating the horns of Yamato no Orochi. Due to their loss of strength, the remaining bushi were ordered to remain in the castle. There are three days left for everything until the Dark Kishin divides Hinamoto in half. One of the spies conveys all the information about the plan to all the black dogs, they must keep Bushi away from Yamato no Orochi. Kanatatsu apologizes to Kuroko and she comes up with a new plan, but a nearby spy overhears everything. On the street, Musashi meets Katsumi and Kijin Asuka live, but everyone notices that Saruwatari and Akihiro's boys are missing. Musashi realizes all of Bushi's hard work and thanks them, the guys begin to praise him. Kuroko comes to the guys with a new task. Talking about the plan with Takeda, he sees the plan as complete madness, because due to the lack of Bushi they will not be able to complete two goals at once, Takeda threatens to leave the battle. The spy again reports everything to the black dogs, who are already choosing their targets for tomorrow's battle, Yataru is prohibited from hunting the goddess, because of failure to fulfill yesterday's duty, Seroku and Shiru despise him. The vanguard continues to destroy the Oni, driving up to Yamato no Orochi, who was effectively defending his own. Kiroko, using his instincts, gradually forced the dragon to destroy the island. While creating smoke, the vanguard slips between the Oni and makes it to the cave where Kishin was waiting for them. Suddenly, a Kahiro's six come running to the rescue and powerfully cut off Kishin's horn. Musashi takes back his words and respects a Kahiro. Yataru can't believe how they broke through. According to Kiroko's plan, the vanguard must blow up the mine and destroy Seroku. The guys are already waiting for the explosion, when Shiru flies to them and moves the explosives onto the take to gang coming towards them. In complete despair, Kiroko, the spy comes up and reveals himself to her, Seroku turns on to laugh at the strategist. But Kiroko, who thought everything through in advance, fools them, she tells how they identified the spies and how they gave them false information. Takeda is doing just fine. Kiroko says goodbye with wishes to die quickly. The loser Seroku is attacked from the smoke by Kenmatsu, defeating the black dogs. Under a flood of memories and anger, Kanatatsu hates himself for his recent loss, and he doesn't want to lose to him a second time, he breaks his sword and dissipates his powers. The enemy seal has been destroyed and all Bushi will now be able to reunite their forces. Kiroko gives the order to destroy all the horns of Yamato no Orochi. Exhausted, Seroku takes out his second sword and proclaims victory, but forgets about Takeda, who is already standing over Shiru. Shiru can't understand what Takeda is doing here. Takeda explains the plan for Musashi, and that they must defeat the three black dogs so that there will be no problems fighting Yamato no Orochi. Takeda assigns Yataru as a target for Musashi while he is busy with Shiru. During the battle, Kanatatsu and Seroku reach the peak of their powers, trying to pierce Kanatatsu with threads, he protects himself with a crystal and then charges a beam from which he hits Seroku. Seroku tries to grab the attacking Kanatatsu with threads, he reads his movement and cuts the threads, but does not read the next attack, and Kanatatsu loses his sight. With the yellow blade, Seroku can control the senses like Tatsuomi. Kanatatsu blindly tries to hit Seroku, but he stands behind him and attacks the guy further. With just words, Seroku burns and curls Kanatatsu's legs. Then he breaks his fingers and knocks the weak Kanatatsu to the ground. Seroku returns the guy's sight so that he can see the death of his allies. While Seroku talks about his life, Kanatatsu takes off his bandages, tying them around himself and his opponent's sword in order to approach him. With the last of his strength, Kanatatsu gets to his feet and pushes his opponent away. He flies up and under the crystal's cover, blasts his energy at himself to dispel the Seroku threats. A surprised Seroku watches as Kanatatsu is freed from his threats. Kanatatsu recovers and immediately heads towards Seroku, but notices that the destroyed threads are again trying to harm him. In order to avoid getting caught by them, Kanatatsu jumps at Seroku at high speed. Crossing swords, Kanatatsu wants to put an end to the battle. Seroku creates a whirlwind of threads that seriously injure the guy, he very deftly strikes him several times, causing him to lose a lot of blood. To save the commander, two allies suddenly come and protect the commander with their own lives. Kanatatsu recalls a conversation with Tatsuomi, where the leader trusted the boy to protect the platoons. Under a flood of memories, Kanatatsu prevents his allies from being killed and covers Seroku's blow with his palm. Having deprived him of movement with his sword, Kanatatsu pierces Seroku's chest and finally defeats the black dog, Kanatatsu's pride takes its toll. Kiroko is informed of what is happening, 
and she leads the final stage of the plan, the White Bushy will take care of rescuing Tatsuomi. Kiroko trusts Takeda to defeat Shiru. Takeda creates an energy cage to fight Shiru. After several conversations, Shiru is about to leave the cage because he is not interested in Takeda. Raising a sword with an unusual ring shape, Takeda notices this and seems to remember that he has already met Shiru and prevents him from leaving, reminding him of this. Having insulted Shiru's prophecy several times, he gets very angry and breaks the cage out of anger, now he intends to make Take to answer for his words. Still without the desire to fight with a sword, Shiru creates a space with water where the Take to gang cannot escape and only suffocate inside. Shiru unlocks the ring's full potential and turns out to be the bushy of the white soul, which is the strongest. Shiru and Take to compare their strengths and Shiru despises all blue souls. Takeda decides to prove that he is not true. The second round begins and Takeda is outmatched by Shiru. Those watching Kajiru's fight cannot believe how powerful Takeda's blue soul is, which he himself possesses. Shiru uses techniques again to avoid using the sword. This time he cuts through the space with lava, which he pours on Takeda. Takeda's allies stop the lava by covering it with water to harden it. Remembering all the consolations towards the Takeda squad, they are ready to show everything of themselves so that Shiru can be convinced that Bushi with blue souls are worth something. Remembering the test of accepting the sword, the squad remembers Takeda's words that the powers of the blue soul are equal to the powers of Kishin, remembering this the squad is encouraged. While Shiru and Takeda are fighting, Takeda creates two forms from the elements of water and fire, directing them at Shiru, but it is too easy for Shiru and he easily cuts through the commander's technique. Shiru cuts the space again to redirect them to a place where they will not be disturbed, Takeda takes water and fire with him. Mocking Takeda's powers, they push each other away and Takeda creates matter in his hand, made of water and fire. The matter forms a blade shape, calling it the strongest technique. Takeda specifically honed this attack for Shiru to repay a debt from the past. In the blink of an eye, Takeda lands a critical hit and destroys Shiru's blade. Takeda returns to the squad, who are very happy to see him back. Another black dog defeated. Ayashi notices a wound on the commander's hand, Takeda says that it was payback for his powerful attack and now for a while, he will not be able to collect Bushi's forces. The Bushi and White continue to kill the Kishins one by one. But Akihiro's squad forbids Musashi and the others to fight with them. Kishin appears behind the guys, Akihiro tells him not to get in the way, but Katsumi is not obliged to listen and cuts Oni. Katsumi encourages the others and they also begin to fight. The squad is divided into two groups. They arrive at the enemy's location, where Mikairu was already located, who noticed Musashi's approach. With her memory lost, she helps Yataru and at one point, she stops and little by little gets her memory back, but for some reason she doesn't want to remember Musashi. Before entering, Akihiro's squad gives the conditions for a joint battle to the others. Akihiro's squad will cut off Kishin's horns and the rest will fight Yataru. Musashi doesn't understand the purpose of these conditions, because they all have to fight back to back. Katsumi explains that Akihiro's squad has a lot of pride and that they just want fame and money. Musashi accepts all the negative words from Akihiro's squad and invites them to become friends by remembering their names. Entering the cave, Yataru was already waiting for the guys who sacrificed his daughters for the sake of merging with the great Kishin. Yataru, who turned into Kishin, creates blades from crystals by controlling them. Noticing that the others are dodging them, he creates blades from his daughters and, raising them up, creates rays that spawn several from the squad. The rest who survived stand full of fear and force themselves not to run away. The only one who is not subject to fear is Akihiro's squad, who attacks Yataru without hesitation. The guys try to transfer their energy to everyone, but Yataru's rays block their path. After several attempts to transfer energy, a blade appears in front of Haruza. Haruza has already resigned himself, but Musashi helps him, breaking the blade. In gratitude, Haruza is only rude to Musashi. Gathering his strength, Musashi attacks the breach, annoying Akihiro's squad in the process. Shimazu noticed that there are more and more rays and there is no room to dodge, but Musashi, not sparing himself, destroys the rays one by one. Yataru does not tolerate this and throws off Musashi. Over time, it restores its rays and seals the walls again. Suddenly Natsuki is covered with rays and, full of fear, he resigns himself. Musashi comes to the rescue, cutting the dark shell of the rays and freeing Natsuki. Shimazu almost manages to connect the energy, but this time the path is blocked by Haruza, and each time Musashi, remembering his father and responding with kindness, saves them. Musashi breaks several of Yataru's blades, and the guys manage to connect the energy with his help. Akihiro smashes Kishin's horn with all his strength. Everyone else rejoices at the victory and relaxes, but strangely enough, Kishin stays alive by absorbing ore. The Takeda squad is wary, because after absorbing a large amount of ore, Kishin can regain his strength. Ayashi and the others try to attack Kishin, but he has already increased his defense and cannot be penetrated from the inside. 
coming up with a plan, Haruza takes back all the words towards Musashi and begins to respect him. Now he does not mind fighting together with Musashi, the guys gradually strengthen their friendship. Haruza wants to increase the chain of energy, so she is looking for someone with a blue soul. Katsumi will be the seventh to increase the chain. By picking on Katsumi, the squad's spirits rise. Katsumi is surprised at how weird their Musashi is. Akihiro, standing to the side, just silently watches everyone. Musashi, who finally noticed him, leads him to the others for a plan, but somehow his squad begins to get angry with him. Haruza tells Akihiro to say what he doesn't like. Akihiro begins to speak out about the frivolity of the squad, and they, in turn, speak out about his indifference to his family. His squad turns against him, showing their displeasure to others. Saying that Akihiro is only using them to rise, he confirms these words and his allies leave him, they quarrel at such a brave moment. Out of anger, Akihiro throws away a valuable item that reminded him of his childhood and strong friendship with the rest of Shimazu, Musashi picks it up and shows it to Fayui. Haruza calls the guys to fight Kishin's horn. They offer Musashi to stand in Akihiro's place, and all the energy will go to him. Having united, the guys were already directing energy to Musashi, but Akihiro stands in front of him, who steals the guy's energy. Shimazu doesn't want to be with him anymore and they ask him to leave. Musashi calms Akihiro down and lets him remember his childhood. In other matters, Akihiro's sword is not to break horns, but it would be better for him if it were so. Akihiro continues to drain energy from his brothers and he eventually overpowers Kishin. The brothers wonder why he has changed in recent battles. In the memories, Akihiro was the only one in the family who became a red soul, and his father appointed him as the leader of the family. Akihiro then refused this, placing all responsibility on Haruza, but his father that after the battle, he himself will understand everything. After defeating Haruza, he still refused, but his father forced him to take over the clan and especially Haruza. In the evening, Haruza, talking about her desire to get a red soul, leaves the squad. Thus began Akihiro's brutal command. The others fight alongside Kishin and Akihiro, who commands them again. He wants the outsiders to connect the energy circuit, and explains how to do it. The brothers don't like it, but there are no other better suggestions. Still they join forces, Akihiro remembers his friends during the battle and treasures them, but he loses his guard and falls into the jaws of Kishin. The brothers are terribly frightened, but notice that the chain hasn't broken yet. Bushi take the orders a retreat from Kishin. Musashi doesn't understand why Haruza doesn't want to help save her brother, to which Haruza replies that she hates her brother and only wishes him dead. While inside Kishin, Akihiro accepted death for the sake of his brothers, who hated him. But Haruza comes to the rescue. Not believing his eyes, Haruza still shows mercy to him, and gives away the very valuable thing that Musashi provided to give to him. To Haruza's kindness, Akihiro is rude again but explains how the lives of his friends are dear to him, which is why he always left them for safety. Haruza cannot believe her brother's words, he becomes even more sad and blames Haruza for the battle of Kishin. Akihiro looks in surprise towards the brothers, who also came to help Akihiro. The brothers, having heard everything that Akihiro said, get angry with him and explain that the brothers' help is normal and that it is not worth leaving them. Starting to attack Kishin, the entire platoon connects the chains for Akihiro, but he loses consciousness after receiving the energy. When Musashi offers to defeat Kishin instead of him, Akihiro stubbornly refuses, saying that if he does not defeat Kishin, then the whole meaning of his life will be lost. Haruza reassures her brother, reminding him that brotherly bonds are above all else. Haruza gives strength to Akihiro and he already gets up to fight. The platoon again creates chains and finally Akihiro breaks Kishin's horn. Kanatatsu gives the command to destroy the remaining horns of Yamato no Orochi, and his platoon manages to do so. Yamato no Orochi is defeated, a lot of kaitsu ore fell from him, Bushi absorb it. Keigo thanks everyone and asks who exactly cut off Kishin's horn. The Shimazu brothers point at Akihiro, he tried to convince him that everyone deserves honor, but Haruza reminds him of his old dream, and Akihiro stops talking. Haruza asks Akihiro to thank Musashi for returning the valuable item to him. He thanks him, not understanding why he clung to him so much. The Alliance now has one last goal, to rescue Tatsuomi. This will be done by Kajiru, Tsugumi and the others. The Bushi notice that after defeating the dragon, the Kaitsu ore does not collect into the sword, but simply flies to the top of the mountain. Tsugumi and Kajiru fight the remaining Oni, but at one point black crystals begin to grow from the mountain. Kanatatsu wants to help a white robes, but with such wounds Masayuki stops him, Kanatatsu really regrets that he cannot help them. Musashi remembers his friends and heads to the top of the mountain where the kaitsu ore was headed. Akihiro and Katsumi ran after him. Having already arrived at the top of the mountain, he is met by Tsugumi and Kajiru, along with the living Tatsuomi. The guys are happy about the last completed goal. Tatsuomi tells how Mikairu talked a lot about Musashi, the words catch him and he runs to save Mikairu. 
Having reached the very top, Musashi and the others notice a black blade floating in the air, near which the real shell of Yataru appears. Preparing for battle, Yataru names his sword Mikairu, Musashi stands up in disbelief. Yataru created the sword of the obsidian goddess from his daughter and is proud of how he beat the rest of the black dogs. Based on the aura, Musashi recognizes Mikairu and becomes very angry. Akihiro warns Natsuki to move away, but Natsuki pretends and says there won't be any problems. Yayatora makes the guy think about his words and uses his sword, shoots a beam at Natsuki, he is saved by Bushi. Full of enthusiasm, Yataru cuts down the Bushi attacking him, calling himself the strongest creature on the planet. Yataru praises his daughter, who has already lost her mind. Musashi crosses swords with him and notices how his red soul is absorbed by Yataru's sword. The others also lose their souls and remember the very move of the goddess when fighting Shiru. Yataru absorbed all of Bushi's powers and unleashed a massive beam that traveled across the entire country. Tatsuomi and Kanatatsu, standing nearby, are very worried. The guys discuss how Yataru merged with the obsidian goddess. When the real one sits in Musashi, they realize that Yataru created a fake goddess from his daughter. But this does not stop him from killing several more bushi. Crossing his swords again, Yataru feels that when struck, the sword seems to become dull. Mikairu, feeling Musashi, through force, remembers him more and more, very reluctantly, so the sword weakens, under the dominance of Mikairu's feelings. The memory drives Mikairu- <laughs>